He's the monster hiding on the web. To him, the internet is a weapon he can use to kill. The ambulance for the address of the emergency. Cook Street was a young boy who got his cups outside. Sisters hunt for their brother's killer. We, we like basically had like a big puzzle. This is Jack Taylor. Do you recognise that, mate? Hmm. And as we were getting more and more information and we were putting it together, we didn't know what the middle bit was. Stephen, did you have any involvement in his death? I did not know, no. We know that somehow all this connected somewhere and we were determined that unless we got in black and white that we were completely wrong, we, we wanted answers and we, we weren't going to stop with that. Did you kill Jack Taylor? I did not know. Stephen Port daily spent hours trawling web porn. Why are you searching for boy drugged rape? Port was a predator. He sought out his victims. Well, I'm just generally looking for general porn. He drugged them. He raped them. That's not general porn, Stephen, is it? He murdered them. He's the killer armed with an app. He's ruined our lives. He's ruined our family. He's took our jack away. He was filming this, and then he was posting it online. You have DNA evidence, you've corroborated that. That was the first use of social media in a missing case. The number of CCTV cameras continues to grow. Serial killers come in all shapes, all sizes, all professions, and all genders. Meeting people via apps and social media websites carries an element of risk. Is the person you're speaking to really the person they are portraying themselves as? Stephen Port was to take the lives of much-loved young men. Two sisters of one victim would choose to take on a challenge to prove their brother Jack had not died from a self-inflicted overdose, as claimed by the police, but had been murdered along with three other men. The detective tools at the disposal of the sisters, the internet and instinct. Instinct because the official version of what had been happening in a secluded corner of Barking didn't make sense to them. We was aware about the other boys that had passed away in Barking um, when obviously Jack had passed away. And we were searching, we was doing our research on the internet, wasn't we? Yes. And that's when we come across um, other boys that had passed away. And it seemed very similar, didn't it? Just yeah. everything seemed quite similar. Yeah, there was lot, lots of, um, when, when we went back on the internet, we, we was trying to find out, because we don't really know Barking. So we was trying to find out like, um, if there was anything else that had happened around that area, um, anything similar. To help in their work, the go-to research tool, the web. Traditionally, you think of everyone sitting there being Little Miss Marple with the internet, using their little grey cells like Hercule Poirot or something. But actually, the level of forensic evidence that you can extract from the web, the degree to which you can look at someone's online profiles, and the digital footprints that people leave behind them almost unknowingly these days, is absolutely crucial in catching killers. After researching events and becoming sceptical about police conclusions, a local journalist who gradually became convinced that an area of London had a serial killer on the loose. It was odd for there to be that number of, of young men found dead within a few kind of hundred square yards of each other. It still seemed strange to us, and so I started saying to the news desk, um, we need to find out what's, what's going on. What was going on involved a man called Stephen Port. Port one day would be interviewed in relation to bodies discovered near or slumped against a wall in this churchyard. In particular, the area around um, the walls of the Abbey, have you ever had any reason to go into that area? No. A new specialist branch of psychology has been generated as experts try to understand online behavior. 
One woman has been investigating the off and online worlds of Stephen Port, an East London man whose life began like so many others. He's a vulnerable uh, child. He looks very normal as a child with probably normal behaviours, um, although we don't know that. He had aspirations to uh, study art. Stephen Port lived in East London with his working class parents. At the age of 16, he went to art school, but unfortunately he had to drop out because it was just too expensive. That may have been a crushing blow to him and his ambitions. Thereafter, he started work as a chef. Around this time, Port also made a revelation. And by the time he reached his mid-twenties, he felt that he was able to come out, to declare to the world that he was gay. His mother had a bit of a problem with it because she had hoped for grandchildren. Port is one for spinning positive about his image. Bald from teenagehood, that's not how he wanted to be seen online, using a wig to cover the truth and he was grandiose in his job description. Stephen Port had a profile that uh, he identified himself as a shy individual, and he also identified himself as being younger than what he actually was. So we are already seeing a manipulation here in terms of the real uh, sense of himself and who he is versus the sort of profile that he has in an online virtual world. Stephen Port painted a picture of himself online that was quite different from the reality of who he really was. He talked up his profession, claiming he was a TV chef, when in reality he cooked in a greasy spoon. He created a different self for himself to lure in young, vulnerable men. Young, vulnerable men like Anthony Walgate who had high hopes when he left his home in Hull for London. All we had seen about Anthony was that he'd been found um, outside a block of flats. That's all we knew, and that it was unexplained. That's literally all we knew about that one. Anthony Walgate is a young 23-year-old gentleman who has relocated from Hull to the bright lights of London. He had ambitions to work in the fashion industry. Anthony's offline world may have been so far so heard it all before, but his online world enabled him to pursue an exotic career option. He uh, was a part-time escort, and his friends said that he was quite choosy about who he engaged with within those kind of environments. There is a problem, however, in an online environment whereby something called the disinhibition effect kicks in and you not necessarily are dealing with the real person. When you're meeting people in an online computer-mediated communication environment, you are not seeing the face-to-face -face normative social interactions. It would be quite difficult to understand and to be able to tell if someone is not being fully truthful. Stephen Port was never fully truthful. On June the 15th, 2014, Stephen Port approaches Anthony via a online website called Sleepy Boys and arranges to meet with him. He offered Walgate 800 pounds to come over. He makes a reference to one of his friends that this is where I'm going um, in case I'm killed kind of thing, this is where I'm going to be. It was a nervous joke. If Anthony had known that Port had already sexually assaulted a string of men, too afraid to report their experiences because of the stigma they felt would accompany the revelation that they had been raped, it's a joke he may not have cracked. He was entering a dangerous world, a world where a predator had already used the internet to trap a victim, and then drugs to render him defenseless. He enticed a man to his flat. He offered him a glass of red wine, which the man drank. He later remembered that it tasted bitter. The man became unconscious. That man survived, but Port was using his flat to practice his modus operandi. Once he got his own flat, he really started to indulge himself in all the things that he hadn't done previously. He was very promiscuous. He had multiple partners. He had parties. A lot of people stayed over. 
By now, Port had become a habitual user of GHB, usually dissolved. Once drunk, the compound reacts in the body. GHB is a recreational drug, often referred to as G. It has been around for some time, but by 2014, it really is being used amongst a particular group of people in particular, um, that's for the, the homosexual community, tend to use this drug recreationally to enhance their um, sexual activity. It is a very dangerous drug in that there is a very small dose that is needed to actually become toxic and for somebody and to cause great harm. Port was inspired by what he found on the web. Stephen Port uh, increasingly becomes immersed in very violent, sexually deviant pornography. Port's sexual tastes were getting quite dark. Over a period of time, he may have been seeking to get more deviant type material. And this is where this desensitization kicks in. And this, is, this may be the case that people within those kind of environments may then take that to an offline environment so that they are satisfying their need for this sexually deviant sort of thrill that they're seeking and that they're getting from pornography. He was doing internet searches for drug-fueled rape. Group sex. He was journeying to a darker place. On June 19th, 2014, Anthony Walgate, the young man who had joked that this is where he might be killed, was unaware of the world that he was entering and knew little about the man he was about to meet. Anthony Walgate, fashion student, male escort, met with Stephen Port on a June evening in 2014. Spiked him or convinced him to take uh, a fatal dose of GHB, had sex with him, he'd become unconscious and, and died, um, whether Port knew he was dead or thought he'd wake up, I'm not sure. The next thing, his body was found propped up in the communal area of Port's Flats with his shirt pulled up over his midriff. Port had the audacity to make the 999 call reporting Walgate's body. Emergency ambulance for the address of the emergency. Cook Street, there's a young boy who got his caps outside, I don't know. At this point, Stephen Port will be in a fight or flight scenario whereby he will have to manipulate the scenario for his own survival so that he can remain free and not be detected. It looks like you've collapsed or had a seizure or something. You're just always just drunk. What this tells us is that this individual may have psychopathic tendencies um, whereby he is narcissistically uh, looking out for himself, albeit something horrendous has happened. So clearly we see a manipulator here, someone who is prepared to go to great lengths to ensure that they are not found. Later that morning, the police arrived to question the man who had telephoned 999, apparently asleep in his flat just a few feet away from where the body had been found. A drowsy Stephen Port confirms that he made the call, but knew nothing about Anthony Walgate. The police came. Port spun them a complete yarn about how he'd just found the body. And for the time being, he got away with it. Some evidence was uncovered of wrongdoing. On June 26th, seven days after the discovery of the body of Anthony Walgate, police seized the phone records which showed Port had been lying. He had invited Anthony over after they'd met on a website. Port changed his story, telling officers that Anthony Walgate had accidentally overdosed on GHB, and Walgate's blood samples confirmed levels of GHB associated with fatal overdoses. The police thought they'd got to the truth of Anthony Walgate's death, 
They thought it was an accident. Critics would later say that if it was a 23-year-old woman, they might have done more. But it was a 23-year-old gay man who had been using sex drugs. No murder here. Move on. For one local journalist, the story he was covering was all too close to home. I, I'm a gay man who lives in East London, you know. I like to think that if somebody, you know, put loads of drugs into me, raped me and left me in a churchyard to die, that the police would investigate that. You do wonder if they'd turned up and they'd been wealthier or older or different ages or, you know, young women. Would the police have been so quick to sort of switch off the investigation? It feels like there was a negligence towards the gay community there that, you know, this could have been any of us, but because, you know, this could have been me. Police had made a crucial mistake, missing the opportunity to examine the laptop that they had earlier taken from Stephen Port. Search terms that Port had used earlier the previous day incriminated him. Internet history showing a disturbing sexual fetish for young comatose men was revealed. It was a mistake that would cost more lives of young men. Stephen Port was charged with perverting the course of justice by having made the 999 call and denying that he had known Anthony Walgate. Released on bail, Port returned to his online world. That day I'd looked at his computer and everything else that like, we, we now know that they had everything. It wouldn't just be Jack's life that was saved. Bordered by a ruined abbey, the Church of St Margaret of Antioch is one of the few parts of Barking that wasn't bombed during the Blitz. Not that Gabriel Kavari, a Slovakian student who had come to London just a few months earlier, knew any of that when he left home for a city he thought liberal in attitudes about sexuality. In Slovakia, Gabriel had met prejudice. He was gay. Uh, he wanted to be in an atmosphere that celebrated and embraced that. Little did he know that once he started looking for partners on the internet and on online dating apps, that he would encounter Stephen Port. He may have been attracted to the profile of Stephen Port, whereby Stephen Port is portraying himself as a sort of a shy, caring individual uh, in an online environment. And that may have been important for Gabriel to meet someone like that, uh, having no idea that, in fact, Stephen Port was just portraying a sense of himself that was untrue. Meeting people via apps and social media websites carries an element of risk. Is the person you're speaking to really the person they are portraying themselves as? Port was not the person he was portraying himself as on the dating website. Someone in his youth, a shy guy. Just four days after moving in with Port and seven weeks after arriving in the promised land where gay men could live without fear, Gabriel Cavari would be dead. He had been given GHB by Port. When he'd uh, become unresponsive, he'd taken him out here and left him. Two months after the body of Anthony Walgate had been found a stone's throw from St Margaret's of Antioch Church graveyard, the body of Gabriel Cavari was discovered. He'd met Stephen Port on a dating app, um, had travelled to his home to meet him and had been spiked, sexually abused, overdosed, left for dead, dumped in a churchyard and was found by a dog walker. Gabriel's murder was a quintessential 21st century crime. It happened because he was using dating apps, using Grindr, very popular, very widespread. Uh, he was plied with a popular sex drug, GHB. It's a tragedy what happened to him, and whether it could have been avoided in the past, who knows? But all you can say for certain is that this was very much a 21st century crime. So did you, did you have any involvement in the, uh, the death of the male that we just spoke about a short while ago, Gabriel Cavari or Gabriel Klein? No, I did not know at all. No. Were you involved in administering any drugs or poisons or noxious substances to him? No, I don't administer drugs to anyone or give drugs to anyone. Local journalist Ramsey Alwakil had a big story on his hands. At that point, 
I thought we can't just keep doing short stories about bodies being found <laughs> because people are going to start asking questions. We were asking questions. Um, so I remember saying to one of the reporters, uh, we've got to get the police there into you about what's going on. Is there a threat to the public? Police knew that a dating app had been playing Cupid, but appeared to believe consenting adults had been having dangerous sex, and that was the cause of the deaths. So Port was unsuspected. Daniel Whitworth, a 21-year-old ambitious chef, lived in the English county of Kent with his long-term boyfriend. When apart, they tried to stay in touch. On the 18th of September, 2014, Daniel arranged to meet Stephen Port in Barking. Unfortunately, these victims did not know what they were getting themselves into. They weren't meeting a person face to face and making a judgment call about that person. They were just going by the app. They wanted free and easy sex. Fine, but it came at a very high price. And did you go with Daniel to meet people? No, no I knew he was doing the same as I was, but I'd see him at a party and there's a brief conversation with him about it, but I've never actually engaged with him outside of a, a place. Unchecked, Stephen Port is still trying to satisfy this sexually deviant behaviour and is carrying on meeting other people, having already killed two people and not been arrested. He is now um, very free to carry on and he has a formula indeed whereby he's meeting people on these uh, sort of dating apps and he's going on to murder them. It was Daniel Whitworth's boyfriend who raised the alarm. Whitworth's body is later found propped up in a sitting position against the same graveyard wall as Gabriel. Daniel Whitworth is 21. He spent some time homeless. He's described by friends as having faced down his demons. So the night he met Stephen Port, he was powerless to defend himself. An extra ingredient is added to the case at this point in the story of the chef Stephen Port. When the police found Daniel Whitworth's body, there was a suicide note clenched in his hand. What was written in the suicide note? Would it reveal who was behind the murders? The Taylor sisters believe its contents should have made police deeply suspicious of events, but they weren't. So others were still at risk from Stephen Port. He knew that he could get away with what he was doing, and that's why he continued and continued in what he was doing, because they allowed him to. It's as simple as that. If, if they'd done their job in the first place, he wouldn't have continued doing what he was doing. He wouldn't have been able to. The suicide note found on the body of Daniel Whitworth seemed to implicate him in the death of Gabriel Cavari four weeks earlier, so suggesting there had indeed been a crime. But that's not how the police saw it. The police accepted it at face value for what it was, a suicide note. It implicated Gabriel, and that, as far as they were concerned, was that. BTW, the note read, please do not blame the guy I was with last night we only had sex, then I left. He knows nothing of what I have done. Stephen is really showing how manipulative he is by referring to the fact that um, not to blame the person who Daniel was with the previous evening. So not only is he manipulating the victim's family um, by faking a suicide note, he's also then trying to make sure he covers his own ground and make sure that he has no blame um, for the murder of Daniel. The note continued, I have taken what GI have left with sleeping pills, so if it does kill me, it's what I deserve. It's simple, childish, almost so obvious, and yet somehow, hiding in plain sight, he managed to continue to go undetected. 
What Stephen Port is trying to achieve here by faking this suicide note is he's trying to show the police that it's quite normative for GHB to be used recreational within this community of people. And he's trying to suggest to the police that sometimes accidents happen within these environments. Um, and again, we can see a real high level manipulative way of thinking um, by Stephen Port to try and throw the scent off himself. The Taylor sisters were skeptical when eventually they saw the note. That doesn't seem like that's a suicide note, you know, someone that's really in a bad place and done something really awful to their self. Police did not check the note for DNA or send it to a handwriting expert for analysis. They told us repeatedly that they had checked it, DNA checked it, sampled it, everything had been done and that there was no reason for us to look into that. We was also told that all the deaths were not connected, which obviously is not true because the suicide letter, in the suicide letter, stated that Daniel had supposedly killed Gabriel. So it was connected. We were told there was no connection. We did this kind of quite hurried interview where he said, yeah, it's weird, but it's not that odd. There's nothing to suggest that they came to any harm. You know, bizarre line now. It's difficult to understand why the police um, did not investigate thoroughly the handwriting of this suicide note and, and lots of other aspects as well. And the, it may be a question as to why they may have done that within this particular community and group of people. The police told the local newspaper that there was no link between the deaths. Ramsey Alwakil was finding it all too hard to believe. Can you reassure our readers? And we got met with, I think, uh, if not a brick wall, then certainly close to it. They just didn't really want to say anything because they thought it would be, you know, whether they thought it would just concern people uh, to see them linked in print, I don't know. Um, I think in the end, we kind of virtually threatened them and said, like, look, I'm going to, we're going to publish a thing saying that there is a link, or not, at least that they are, you know, there's something weird going on if you can't reassure us, you know, so you've got to, you've got to tell us if, if there's no reason to worry, then, you know, say so. And at that point, I think we finally got the interview. How can you just take a letter for face value and, and just assume that that person's wrote that letter? When they must be so low and they write a letter literally saying, don't blame the man that I was with last night. I think it was about an hour before deadline. I think I pulled the story off the page shortly before it's press put something else on there, which was this, this interview with, with the detective, and, and I sort of thought, well, it's not that satisfying, but at least we've got an answer, which is, you know, carry on as you were, no need to avoid the graveyard. There's no serial killer on the loose. I mean, it turns out there was a serial killer on the loose. In March 2015, six months after Daniel Whitworth had died, Stephen Port was convicted for perverting the course of justice in connection with the death of Anthony Walgate, and he was jailed. He had lied when claiming on his 999 call that he had not been with Anthony earlier on the night that the young man had died. Port was released after three months, so as free to kill again. In September 2015, Port had returned to his old habits, meeting gay men via a dating app. The local media was, for now, accepting of the police assertion that the deaths were not criminal. This was an extremely dangerous time to be a gay man in East London. Bodies were turning up and being dismissed as overdoses. They were gay young men who'd overdosed on the same drug. Jack Taylor, a 25-year-old, lived with his parents three miles away in Dagenham. He worked as a forklift truck driver. Jack was very um, much the life and soul, and he would get on with everybody, he'd be really sociable. Um, he, he, was, he was a really friendly person, like, he was the sort of person, he walked in a room and he lit the room up. He was the best little brother that we could have ever have wished for. Very happy, always there for his family, loving, caring, just everything that you'd want a little brother to be, really. We're a very close family, and, it, you know, with Jack, he... He was so loving and caring and funny, and he always, always had your best interests at heart. 
Jack wasn't a vulnerable person. Jack was not. Jack had a lot of confidence. Um, and he knew what he wanted to do in life. And he went out there and done it. And, you know, he's the sort of person, when, when you have somebody say, they make the world a better place, that, that's exactly what he did. Jack did keep a secret from his sisters, his sexuality. Me and Jenny had our suspicions for some years that Jack could have been. Um, and we'd kind of give him the impression that if he was, it was fine, he could tell us. Um, but because he did have a lot of girlfriends, um, we now think that it was a case of, you know, he could have been both. He could have been curious. Jack Taylor was a regular at the Trades Hall Club in Dagenham, where he'd spent the Saturday of the evening of September the 12th. At 10.30, he's seen arriving at the hall. And at 12.30, he leaves. There are six million CCTV cameras in Britain today. Six million. That's a huge number. After leaving the Trades Hall, Jack calls a minicab, checks in on a dating app. We understand that when people are immersed in these kind of technologies that their normal face-to-face -face interactions fall to the wayside. He maybe had a drink or two and you have a real scary environment for someone to immerse themselves in, interacting with someone who is potentially very, very dangerous. And because his inhibitions were lowered at this point, he may not have realised the danger and or he may not have put the usual sense check that somebody would when encountering somebody new who they don't know a stranger in an online dating environment. He travels to Cambridge Road in Barking. He's arranged to meet Stephen Port. Shortly after 3am, Port is picked up on security cameras near Cambridge Road in Barking Town Centre. He moves away from the safety of this online world and meets Stephen face to face. A few minutes later, Port can be seen on Cambridge Road. Jack Taylor marching in time with Stephen Port. I show um, you a picture. We'll call this CRT. See, this is Jack Taylor. Do you recognise that, mate? Mm. Jack Taylor filmed with Stephen Port. It now seems certain that Jack was out of his depth, uncertain what he was doing there, uncertain about his sexuality. Four hours after the meeting on Cambridge Road, Stephen Port blocked his own Grinder account wiping out all communication. He deletes his account and this really just highlights this manipulative uh, behaviour of Port in terms of making sure he's safe and he's evading being caught so he can carry on doing what he's done before. And we're seeing a pattern here whereby he's meeting people on these um, websites, these dating apps. He's then going on with a fake profile and he's then deleting those accounts. So he has quite a tried and tested method uh, for his victims at this point in time. Port thought that what he was doing was never going to be detected. Every keystroke leaves a trace. By closing his Grindr account, Port had actually left evidence, specifically that he'd gone to the trouble of closing the account. At just after 1pm the following day, 36 hours after being captured on camera with Stephen Port, the body of Jack Taylor is discovered by a bin man, propped up in the graveyard at the Church of St Margaret of Antioch. In an ordinary home on an ordinary estate just a few miles away, there was extraordinary grief. Word reached the family that Jack Taylor was dead. I don't think you can put how much we miss him into words, to be honest. I don't think you can. Any of us. It's just, um, our worlds have just, just been squashed. It, it, you know, it, it's hard enough when you lose somebody, anyway. But when you lose somebody and you're told, had something had been done earlier, 
Jack would still be here. It, it, it literally rips you to pieces. I mean, you know, we, we don't sleep. Our whole worlds are upside down and they will continue to be for the rest of our lives. September 2015, 16 months after the discovery of the first body in the vicinity of the graveyard at St. Margaret's, the bodies of three other men had been found propped against the wall in the same graveyard. Autopsies would establish that all three had levels of GHB consistent with an overdose. The last being Jack Taylor, whose family were confused. We were so upset the fact of where Jack was found, it was, it was just awful. And when they actually said, but you've got to understand, this is somewhere where people come and do drugs, this is also a gay mate. You know, it, they, they gave us the impression that this is normal. It's not normal. That, that, that was our Jack that was sitting there, it's not normal. Quite a lot of people within these communities use uh, the GHB drug and they don't um, end up dead. For Ramsey al -Wakil, the link was now too obvious. Alarm bells were ringing. When you think that there was so much linking these deaths to each other and to Stephen Port, you have to think how smoking does a gun have to be? Jack Taylor's family now believed that he'd been murdered. Jack Taylor's sisters were not satisfied with the verdict given to them by the police that their brother had taken his own life. They started looking online. They started doing their own research. They became 21st century citizen detectives. They started to notice some similarities between the death of Jack Taylor and that of three other young men who had died in a quiet corner of East London People would have relied on sort of authorities to research various aspects. Um, and nowadays they're able to do that in an online environment because there is so much data available. And that's when we started to get a little bit suspicious. Not suspicious with Jack's death, because we was already suspicious, which is why we were doing what we were doing. Suspicious the fact that there could be a link here. That's when we started to think that there was so much more to it. You just get a gut feeling and you've got to go with your gut. The police found evidence of GHB on Jack Taylor, maintaining this was a simple overdose. His sisters refused to believe it. We asked the police um, about the syringe that was found on Jack and it wasn't used. So you're telling us it wasn't used, but you're also telling us that he just sat there and injected himself and, and done an overdose. Stephen Port was still a free man. He was not a suspect in any crime. Four men had died but the police did not believe there had been a criminal offence. What would it take to capture a serial killer when the police did not believe there was a serial killer? The Taylors now began to play a big part in the story of Stephen Port. Our family is our life and we will do anything for our family and we will do anything for Jack and we will continue the fight until we get the right justice. It just, it, we just was never gonna stop, was we? Mm. It was just a fight that we was going to continue. And it, at the time, it felt like we was fighting and we didn't, we didn't know what we was trying to get to. We knew that we needed to find out what had happened to Jack, but we didn't know what. So we just, we knew we had to get the answer, the right answer for Jack and the right answer for mum and dad. The police had concluded that a drugs overdose was responsible in the case of the death of four men found in similar circumstances in or near this graveyard. It was bereaved relatives trawling the internet for evidence who forced the police's hand to go further. The Taylor sisters believed their brother had been murdered along with the other three men. We just needed the proof and we was not going to stop until we got the proof, the absolute proof. You never want to be, right? You know, you had that feeling when we spoke about this quite often. Um, we didn't want to be right, but we knew we was going to be because we knew Jack. We felt like we was doing their job and we should never, ever have been put in that situation. We was trying to pick up mum and dad, pick them up. They was on the ground. They was totally devastated. We was devastated. We, we should have been, well, we shouldn't have been grieving because we should never have been put in that situation. But we should have been grieving. We shouldn't have been doing their job. It was the case of Daniel Whitworth which gave the sisters hope that the police would re-examine the evidence. 
something in the note simply didn't ring true. It was very, very small uh, part of the suicide note. Very brief. And it was very brief. Um, we read that, and just that little bit was enough for me and my sister to put that forward to the, the police and say, this doesn't sound like a suicide note. This, sound, this particular bit that we can read sounds like a, a confession. That line in the suicide note that Daniel Whitworth allegedly wrote just as he was about to take his own life, please don't blame the guy I was with, that line didn't ring true to Jack Taylor's sisters. And we asked if it had been tested. We got told, well, of course it would have been. Um, and we said, well, you, you need to make sure because that doesn't seem like that's a suicide note, you know, someone that's really in a bad place and done something really awful to their self. That, that seems like there's so much more to that. The police, listening to the sisters under media pressure, decided to re-examine the evidence. Soon they trawl CCTV for images of Jack Taylor. And it's now that they find him with Stephen Port. The case against Port began to unfold. The suicide note is tested for DNA. As careful as Port tried to be, he still left some DNA evidence. Daniel Whitworth was found with a blue sheet that had actually come from Port's address. And of course, that had Port's DNA on it. Very compelling evidence. Further tests are carried out on the evidence and on Gabriel Cavari's sunglasses, Stephen Port's DNA. Then more emerged about the suicide note. I mean, Stephen, did you, did you write this letter here, CRT 11? No, I didn't. The photos of it that's found with Daniel? No. No. A handwriting expert examined the suicide note that had been found in Daniel Whitworth's hand. He compared it to samples of writing done by Port. And guess what? Port wrote that suicide note. Are you telling us the truth, Stephen? I'm telling you the truth, yes. About the letter? Yes. Stephen Port was arrested in October 2015, 15 months after he had begun killing. Highly unusual way to die for one person. This is four, all found very close to where you live. Stephen Port, a man with a fetish for sex with unconscious, boyish looking men, was convicted in November 2016 of the murder of four men and sentenced to life. All found dead. Stephen? I understand, but... Close to your house. One of them had been in your house, either just before at the time when he died and was found to have large quantities of a drug in his system. Port was a predator. He sought out his victims. All men, young men, the type of men that you mm. say that you find attractive. He drugged them, he raped them. All now dead, Stephen. He murdered them. He was a psychopath. He was a complete psychopath who, it, it didn't, stop him it, it didn't stop him it, it doesn't even seem like it was a compulsion he was he was almost doing it recreationally the, the whole thing is just completely incomprehensible to me it is extraordinary that this gentleman Stephen Port was allowed and able to carry on um, murdering uh, other people and you know contacting other victims and covering his own tracks it's extraordinary and heartbreaking that there was not some intervention sooner which would have saved people's lives time when Jack Taylor is either dead or dying you're searching for uh, boy drugged rape, etc. Port was very much a 21st century murderer. He found his victims through apps and on social media websites. In fact, Port created a false identity for himself on such a website. 
Stephen, did you have any involvement in his death? I did not know, no. Did you kill Jack Taylor? I did not know. If you stood up and did the right thing in the first place, we wouldn't be where we are and Jack wouldn't be where he is. He's a monster. That, that, that's all he is, he's a monster. He had, he had no value for life and he didn't care what he did to boys and what he would do to people's families by what he's done. hundred percent, he didn't care what he was doing. He didn't care if they lived or died. 